Hello everybody. Today I am starting module 2 and this is the first lecture of this module of the course vibration of continuous system. In the earlier module we have learned various techniques for this vibration analysis say vibration system or oscillatory system reduces to a differential equation after modeling. It may be ordinary differential equation if it is a discrete system and partial differential equation if it is a continuous system. Although we have uh, given the fundamental background of this solution of the vibration system and the characteristics of the oscillator and discuss the transform technique also to obtain the solution, but we have not given any attention so far in the formulation of the problem. In various complicated problem, not simple as spring mass oscillator, we need to apply different techniques to obtain the uh, this differential equation of motion. Because first objective of the vibration analysis is to obtain a differential equation of motion. And then we think for the solution whether the analytical solution will be uh, available or can be obtained or we should go for numerical computation. Okay. So today our discussion will be formulation of the problem using equilibrium approach that means considering the, uh, the motion of the body applying Newton's law or applying a instantaneous dynamic equilibrium that was given by D. L. Ambers. We will discuss how the different problems can be formulated. Okay. So, first we will discuss about the coordinate system and uh, we shall explain what is uh, constrained coordinates and what is holonomic system and non holonomic system. Then we will start the equilibrium approach to formulate the dynamic problem and we shall give the solution of some problems. Okay. The discussion will be in general, it will be applicable for a discrete system consisting of single degree freedom or multi degree freedom as well as with little uh, change it can be applied to a continuous system. Okay. So, first let us discuss the coordinate system. In study of the dynamics we encounter two types of coordinates. One is discrete coordinates. It defines the displacement and forces at a set, set of discrete points in terms of the components having specified directions. Say here discrete points are chosen the four corners you can see here and we have assigned the coordinates. Coordinates may be in the direction of the translatory motion or it may be in the direction of the rotational motion. So, coordinates we mean a general uh, term which uh, may indicate your translatory motion or it, it may indicate a rotational motion. Here you can see at this joint the three displacement coordinates are assigned and you can see here they are also orthogonal that means along three principal directions x y z in coordinate Cartesian system we align this displacement u1, u2 and u3 and similarly about three Cartesian axis x y z we assign rotational component of the coordinates as this u4 u5 and u3. Similarly come at this joint uh, you will find that uh, this uh, other coordinates that is assigned is u8 here along this direction u8 translatory motion and then u9 vertical motion you can see and then another axial motion that you can see u7. So, these are the three translatory coordinates and rotational coordinates are also mentioned u10, u11, u12. 
like that in other joints also we assign the coordinates. So these are the discrete coordinates and these are given at a set of predetermined uh, points so that uh, the these coordinates are also aligned in the direction of forces and moments. Generally the component directions at each point are mutually perpendicular. Okay. Now we come across distributed coordinate system because in continuous when we model the continuous uh, body for vibration analysis whether it is one dimensional, two dimensional or three dimensional we assume that the properties physical properties that is mass, steepness, damping etc are distributed in space. Of course, the distribution may be um, uniform or may not be uniform, but the properties will be a function of the space coordinates x, y, z. So here to illustrate such type of coordinate system, we explain with the help of a cantilever beam. Consider a cantilever beam. It is fixed at this end and free at this end and you can see the length of the beam is L. Okay. So the beam may deflect in different ways and these are the deflected shape of the beam that uh, may assume in the time of vibration which will give you the different mode shape or shape function of the cantilever beams. Now here number of functions that you are seeing phi 1x, phi 2x, phi 3x, phi 4x these are defining the displaced shape of the beam. Now when you combine all these displacement shape you will get the actual displacement of the beam. So actual deflection of the beam is given by say wx equal to phi 1x p1 phi 2x p2 plus phi 3x p3 plus phi 4x p4 where p1 p2 p3 p4 are amplitude assigned to these functions. So in the summation form it can be written as phi i p i i varies from 1 to 4. Now general expression in 3D cases will be say displacement u b w in respective uh, direction of Cartesian axis x y z is equal to summation of say phi i x y z uh, p i but uh, of course this um, uh, here only four shapes are included but you can encounter other shapes also means uh, it will be in general the summation may goes up to infinity okay. now let us discuss the constraints in some of the cases when we study the dynamics problem we find uh, there is a constraint in, in some cases there is no constraints. The aircraft flying in air uh, space exhibit a rigid body motion. Of course the slender component like wing etc undergoes the elastic deformation also. So this type of problem includes both rigid body dynamics as well as the elastic vibration analysis. Now here we will discuss the constraint. Let us take an example of simple pendulum which is uh, having a mass m suspended by a string of length l in extensible cord of length l and it is oscillating in the plane of x y. Okay. Now you can easily verify that length of the, uh, the cord is given by x square plus y square equal to L square. Okay. Now x, y are physical coordinates. x, y actually are the physical coordinates. We measure it at any point on the uh, cord or to locate the mass of the pendulum during the vibration. We assign the coordinate x and y. Okay. Now in this case, we need only one coordinate to specify the direction of the mass. Although there are two variables x and y which locates the mass, however 
b x and y are related by a constant equation which is given by x square plus y square equal to l square. So here you can understand although the physical coordinates are x and y but we need only one coordinate to express the position of m that means x and y are not independent. So therefore the coordinate that assigns the position of the pen mass of the pendulum is the angular rotation theta or any of the variable x and y. Okay. Now let us take an example of double pendulum. Okay. The position of m1 here you can see at any instant of time it is given by two coordinates x1 and y1. And similarly for the mass m2 the coordinates are x2 and y2 and therefore we actually see that for one mass two coordinates are required and another mass another two coordinates are required so degrees of freedom are 4 but it is not so because we can see uh, there are some constant equations so one constant equation is that x1 square plus y1 square equal to l1 square where l1 is the length of the chord for the first pendulum and l2 is the length of the chord for the second pendulum. So for this second mass m2 we can write x2 minus x1 whole square plus y2 minus y1 whole square equal to l2 square. Therefore although there are four uh, uh, variables required to define the position of mass m1 and m2. We actually require two independent variables theta1 and theta2 to locate the mass m1 and m2. So therefore degrees of freedom are actually two. Degrees of freedom are also called the generalized coordinate. Okay. So we understood what is uh, meant by degrees of freedom. The minimum number of independent coordinate is degree of freedom. They are also known as generalized coordinates. Now if a system of n particles satisfy C constraint equations, then number of degree of freedom of a particle is n is equal to 3n minus C. That means we have seen that each constraint equation reduces the degree of freedom of a system by 1 that we can verify here degrees of freedom as the coordinates as it appears x1 y1 and x2 y2 but there are two constraint equations so 4 minus 2 that means each constraint will reduce the degrees of freedom by 1 so therefore degrees of freedom for this system is 2 which are theta 1 and theta 2 and theta 1 and theta 2 are called the generalized coordinate. Now a system in which constraints are functions of the coordinates and time then it is called holonomic system. Constraint equations are f x y z t equal to c where f is a function of x y z t, t is a time index and the functions are only involving the displacement but not the derivative of the displacement component. So such type of constraint equation is related to holonomic system and we have found that these two equations constraint equation indicates that system is holonomic as earlier single pendulum is also a holonomic system. But there are system in which the constraint equations are not found in this form. So this indicates that it is a holonomic system but if it is not like that if in, in that case the constraint equation will be in terms of velocity or acceleration higher derivatives of the variable coordinates then we call it as a non-holonomic constraint. Now consider a unicyclist moving along the curve at any instant of time the velocity is directed along the tangent to the curve. Okay. So we need actually at any point along the curve that means at any instant of time we require three coordinates x, y and theta and these are independent. So in that case degrees of freedom are 3. You can verify it 
that v is velocity, v is the vector and v is the magnitude, v bar is a vector and v is the modulus of this vector that is the velocity magnitude of the velocity. So, we can write the vector including this uh, incorporating the unit vector along x and y axis as i and j. So, velocity vector is written as v cos theta i, i is the unit vector along the x axis and v sin theta j, j is the unit vector along y axis. So, here we can see x dot is equal to v cos theta and y dot is equal to v sin theta. So, relation between y and x can be obtained as y dot is equal to x dot tan theta. So, this relationship is a constant relation and it is a function of derivative of the coordinates not the coordinate itself and the time. So, therefore, this type of system is an example of non-holonomic constraints. Okay. Now, let us take a example of rigid jointed plane frame and we require to find out the degrees of freedom of the plane frame. Okay. We can see here that these are the supports of the frame and this is fixed. So, that means here the component of the displacement is 0 because this is a rigid joint. So, it is 0, but here at the joint we assign the coordinates u1, u2, u3 and then uh, this u4, u5, u6 and here although the displacement are 0, let us initially put the displacement component and then again we will uh, find out the constraint equation so that we can show that in different assumptions the degrees of freedom of the frame. So, u7 is the displacement along the horizontal direction, u8 is the displacement along the vertical direction and u9 is the rotation. Similarly, here you can see u10, u11 and u12 are the displacement components. Displacement here it is a general term which indicates the translatory uh, coordinate as well as the rotational coordinate. Now, here you can see for this system constraint equations are because these are fixed these two ends are fixed. So, u7 equal to u8 equal to u9 equal to u10 etcetera are 0 up to 12. So, this displacement component vanishes because of digit joints here this uh, fixed base. So, degrees of freedom for that because there are you can see 6 constraint equation and here we find initially there are 3 coordinates assigned at each joint. So, there are 12 degrees of freedom 12 coordinates that are assigned, but how many coordinates are independent that we can find only by subtracting the constraint number of constraint equation. So, number of constraint equations are 6. So, 12 minus 6 equal to 6. So, 6 is the degrees of freedom here. So, what are the degrees of freedom here u1, u2, u3, u4, u5, u6. So, in that case the assumption was that the column is extensible as well as beam is also extensible. This is axial deformation of the column and beam are considered. Okay. Now, if the columns are inextensible, then if we take this case, if the columns are inextensible in various practical application, this assumption is uh, valid. So, in that case, we can assume that u2 and u5 are 0. So, that means another two extra constant equations are obtained. So, in that case the degrees of freedom are found as 12 minus 8 equal to 4. Previously we got the 6 uh, are the constant equation. Now, additional two equations are obtained here and therefore, we get this degrees of freedom as 4. Now, again if I consider the beam as inextensible then we can see that u1 equal to u4. So, another one equation is added. So, constant equation now previously it was 8, now it increases by 1. So, constant equation is 9. So, actually degrees of freedom for this system when the column and beam is assumed to be are assumed to be inextensible, 
then it is degrees of freedom is 12 minus 9 equal to 3. Okay. In many cases, the constraints are function of coordinates and their time derivative. I have told you earlier with a example of a cyclist moving along a uh, curved path. Uh, such as this equation, how it is obtained? If you see this equation, which is a equation that is uh, satisfied by the single pendulum which is under motion oscillation and x and y are the Cartesian coordinate and c uh, length of the uh, this chord is l here it is l square is say for example c now if you integrate this okay you will get x x dot y y dot equal to 0 so you will get this and again if you differentiate this this equation you will get x dx by t plus y dy by dt equal to 0 ok so this equation is obtained now if this equation can be integrated to find a equation which is uh, related with the displacement component not with the derivatives then the system is again holonomic. So, if this equation is integrated, again we come back to x square plus y square is equal to c. So, therefore, the constraint uh, this uh, in holonomic system, even the relationship is obtained in terms of velocity or time derivative of this displacement component. After integration, we can find a relation that is uh, the containing the variables with coordinates and time. So, this is the example on additional information about this, uh, this holonomic system. The system is holonomic. In other cases, say for example, f x y z x dot plus g x y z f g h are function of x y z and x dot y dot z dot are the velocity component in x y z direction. So, such type of equation cannot be integrated to find the relation containing the coordinates and time. So, therefore, this, this type of system is known as non-holonomic system. Okay. Now, let us come to the uh, formulation of the problem using equilibrium approach. The equilibrium approach as I have told actually it is nothing but application of Newton's second law. However, there is one historic evidence of this equilibrium equation that is obtained in dynamic cases which is given by D. Alembert. So, D. Alembert principle is here applicable and it is derived from the Newton's second law. Okay. Now, let us first discuss what is Newton's second law. So, to write the equation of motion or to derive the equation of motion using equilibrium approach or Newton's second law, first we require to make a free body diagram. Free body diagram how we will make? We isolate a part of the structure and to show there all forces that are acting in the system. But one thing is that in that free body diagram when we use the Newton's law, second law, the inertia force is not shown. So, when we apply the Newton second law, the force is given by mass into acceleration. It is in the vector form. So, f is a vector and acceleration is also vector and m is the mass of the system. So, that is the simple Newton law that we already know and if I write in the vector form using the Cartesian component then we can write sigma f x i cap plus sigma f y j cap plus sigma f z k cap equal to m a x is the component of the acceleration in the x direction into i cap plus component of the acceleration in y direction j cap plus component of the acceleration in z direction k cap. So, we can see that the vector equation is obtained using the Newton's law if the motion in three directions are considered. So, equating the component of each of the component i, j, k from both sides, we can write the 
the Newton's law for a rigid body or any body even under um, elastic deformation also when we consider the forces elastic forces we can apply this law. So, this we can write summation of f x equal to m a x and suffix is given as g which means that acceleration is referred to the center of gravity. Then similarly this summation of forces in f y direction is m f y a y g where this uh, forces are given in two orthogonal direction f x and f y and the summation of moment about a point O is given by this sigma m equal to i naught alpha where alpha is the angular acceleration. So, this equation is also applicable and it is also obeying the Newton's second law. Okay. But the motion is rotational therefore, we equate the inertia torque with the total torque. Here we equate the, the mass into acceleration that is the inertia force with the corresponding uh, force in the respective direction. Okay. Now, let us see what is the D'Alembert's equation. You will see that D'Alembert's equation in Newton's law there is practically no difference. Both are same, but let us discuss. So, if we take a spring mass system for example and also with damper and uh, it is acted upon by a force time bearing force Ft. So, D'Alembert's considered that instantaneous equilibrium during the motion. So, the state of dynamic equilibrium established in this system by adding a fictitious force and this fictitious force is nothing but the inertia force. So, there is practically no difference between the D'Alembert's equation and Newton's law. So, if I draw the free body diagram and wish to apply D'Alembert's equation, let us uh, show the forces in the free body diagram. So, the inertia force that is acting uh, opposite to the direction of motion is shown here m x double dot and other forces spring force and damping force are shown k x c x dot. So, at any instant of time if we sum all the forces in the horizontal direction and equate to 0, then we get f minus m x double dot minus k x minus c x dot equal to 0. So, this is nothing but the same equation that we can obtain using the Newton's law also. In the Newton's law, we will write f is equal to uh, m x double dot. Now, here f includes minus k x minus c x dot plus f. So, ultimately you will get the same result whether you apply D Lambert's equation and the Newton's law. But some author prefers to show the inertia forces in the free body diagram and to consider the equilibrium of the forces at any instant of time. So, this follows automatically D Lambert's principle. Now, let us give an example, derive the equation of motion of dynamic model using the force balance. Okay. The bar is rigid okay, uh, which has a mass m and moment of inertia j. So, the mass of the uh, body is uh, assumed to be lumped at the center of gravity. The model represents a half car. So, it is a half car model undergoing the vertical bounce motion as well as the uh, rotation along the longitudinal axis. So, this type of model is frequently used in the study of vehicle dynamics. Okay. So, how to obtain the equation of motion that is our concern. Now, first we draw the free body diagram. So, we take this is the static equilibrium position. Okay. So, showing the dimension here and we assume that the displacement of the center of gravity from this 
static equilibrium position at any instant of time is x and rotation of the rigid body along the longitudinal axis is theta. So, we get two independent variable x and theta. Therefore, if we see that at the point of attachment here, the spring force is k1 into x minus l1 theta. So, you can see that uh, the spring is stressed by x minus l1 theta here. So, similarly, if I take the derivative of this displacement and multiply it by c1, we get the damping force. So, total force acting at this point is k1 x minus l1 theta plus c1 x dot minus l1 theta dot. Uh, there is no base motion. So, we do not consider any uh, relative displacement. You note it. But when the this type of thing is subjected to a base motion also, we should consider the relative displacement to find out the spring forces. At the other end, say this is uh, the half curve model is moving in this direction. So, this is front side and this is rear side. In the rear front point of attachment of the spring and damper dashboard, we get these forces as k2 into x plus l2 theta plus c2 x dot plus l2 theta dot. Okay. So, we again write apply the Newton second law and we get this uh, summation of f is equal to m x double dot and this is uh, all the forces that are taken into account we write this Newton's law m x double dot equal to minus k 1 x minus l 1 theta plus c 1 x dot minus l 1 theta dot and therefore, we write here uh, k 2 x plus l 2 theta plus c 2 x dot plus l 2 theta dot. For angular motion, rotation along the longitudinal axis is considered. Again, we apply the Newton's second law. Okay. So, summation of moment equal to the inertia torque that is j is the mass moment of inertia of the rigid body about this center of gravity and theta double dot is the angular acceleration. So, we can write here say j theta double dot is the inertia torque and therefore, taking the moment of this forces at the point of attachment of the spring and dashboard, we get this for this force the lever arm is L1 for small rotation and we get the moment is k1 x minus l 1 theta plus c 1 x dot minus l 1 theta dot bracket closed into l 1 lever arm is l 1 for small displacement. Similarly, uh, for the other spring force it is in the opposite direction. So, therefore, we assign a negative sign and the the moment is written as k 2 x plus l 2 theta plus c 2 x dot plus l 2 theta dot and bracket closed L2. Okay. So, you are getting two equation one is for translatory motion that is the vertical motion of the rigid body and another you are getting the rotational motion that is a rotation about the longitudinal axis of the body. So, these two equations can be arranged in this fashion so that we can identify the system matrices. So, writing the equation in this form m x double dot plus k 1 plus k 2 into x minus k l 2 minus k 1 l 1 into theta. Because we identified that there are uh, two independent coordinates x and theta. So, our response vector consists of x and theta and therefore, this uh, velocity vector will be x dot theta dot and acceleration vector will be x double dot and theta double dot. So, similarly for uh, damping also it is found that it consists of c 1 plus c 2 x dot plus c 2 l 2 minus c 1 l 1 theta dot equal to 0. And for rotational motion we get j theta double dot plus 
k2 l2 minus k1 l1 x plus k1 l1 square plus k2 l2 square theta plus c2 l2 minus c1 l1 x dot plus c2 l2 square plus c1 l1 square theta equal to 0. The advantage of writing uh, in this form that we can express the equation in matrix form involving three terms one is inertia force and another is damping force and another is spring force. So here you can see this mass matrix or inertia matrix is diagonal m0 0j and here we are getting the damping matrix c1 plus c2 c2 into l2 minus c1 l1 c2 l2 minus c1 l1 c1 l1 square plus c2 l2 square and you are getting this the velocity vector here it is given. Similarly for stiffness we get k1 plus k2 uh, one element then this element is k2 l2 minus k1 l1 then you will get k2 l2 minus k1 l1 and you can note that the mass matrix although it is diagonal and symmetrical also the other matrices the damping and stiffness matrices are also diagonal. So here you can get that uh, you find that the stip, uh, damping matrix is diagonal matrix similarly stiffness matrix here you can see the diagonal elements here the element in the first row second column is equal to the element in the second row first column. So you are getting k2 l2 minus k1 l1 here and k2 l2 minus k1 l1 which is same and then here again you get k1 l1 square plus k2 l2 square and another important characteristics you can note here that uh, the diagonal element are always positive whereas the off diagonal element may be positive or may be negative depending on the value of the c2 l2 c1 l1 or k2 l2 k1 l2 k1 l1 so what we understand that for a stable system the diagonal element should be always positive and the off diagonal element may be negative but it should be the matrix should be symmetric okay another example we consider here it is a 3 degree of freedom model but it is under only transitory motion so this type of model may represent a three storied shear building shear building means these beams and floors are assumed to be rigid and columns are only in extensible so if we apply the newton second law we can find the equation of motion but basic philosophy of obtaining the equation of motion using Newton's law is that first you have to isolate the part of the body here it is a lump mass and then you have to draw the free body diagram without free body diagram the equation of motion cannot be written correctly so therefore first draw the free body diagram of the mass m1 let us see mass m1 and q1 q2 q3 are the generalized coordinates here capital q1 capital q2 capital q3 are the external forces that is applied on m1 m2 and m3 now here you can see this end is fixed so spring force is k1 q1 and damping force is c1 q1 dot and here you can see because of relative displacement of this end and this end we are getting that the spring force here is k2 q2 minus q1 and similarly damping force is c2 q2 dot minus q1 dot so when we go to this uh, mass m2 this force will be same but it will be in the reverse direction to maintain the equilibrium similarly the other forces considering the relative displacement of the spring that is attached between the mass m2 and m3 and the dashpot that is attached between m2 and m3 we can write the spring force and damping force here for the mass m2 at this end this k2 into q3 minus q2 and c3 
into q3 dot minus q2 dot and here we write these forces in the reverse direction to maintain the equilibrium. Now we can write the Newton's second law for each mass and then we get the equation of motion. So m1 q1 double dot equal to minus k1 q1 equal to minus c1 q1 dot plus k2 q2 minus q1 plus c2 q2 dot minus q1 dot plus q1 here it will be q1 for the first mass. Similarly for the other masses the equation of motions are written m2 q2 double dot like that minus k2 q2 minus q1 minus c2 q2 dot minus q1 dot plus k3 into q3 minus q2 plus c3 q2 3 dot minus q2 dot plus q2. Like that for mass 3 the equation of motions is written here and uh, our objective is to write the equation of motion in the matrix form because it is consisting of uh, several degrees of freedom. So arranging the three equation in this form so that we can isolate, we can identify the mass matrix, damping matrix and stiffness matrix. So writing the three equation that is arranging this in this fashion and right hand side of this equation represents the external forces. And here you can see the mass matrix again will be diagonal consisting of the elements m1, m2, m3 that will appear in the diagonal. Now have to write this in this matrix form. You can see the first row of the damping matrix will be c1 plus c2 minus c2 and 0. Okay. Any stable dynamic system you will get symmetric uh, damping and uh, symmetric stiffness matrix as well as symmetric mass matrix. But most of the cases when the mass is lumped, lump mass model is considered you will get a diagonal mass matrix. Okay. So we now discuss uh, another method that is called phase plane. So actually this is applicable to autonomous system. In autonomous system the time t, time parameter t does not appear explicitly in the differential equation of motion. Thus only differential of time dt will appear in such equation. Uh, let us consider a case that is a simple oscillator with mass spring damper and you can see this equation x double dot plus f x comma x dot equal to 0. We find the phase plane by assuming that x dot equal to y that is the velocity y is the velocity and y dot is the acceleration. So y dot equal to acceleration is x double dot it is nothing but minus f x x dot. So if x and y are Cartesian coordinate the x y plane is called the phase plane that means along x axis the displacements are plotted, displacement variables are considered and along y axis the velocity variable are considered. The state of the system is defined by displacement and velocity where y is dx by dt, y dot, uh, y is dx by dt. So velocity is y but it is represented along this x axis, vertical axis. As the state of the system changes the point of on the phase plane moves thereby generating a curve which is called the trajectory. Now here state velocity is defined as v equal to root over x dot square plus y dot square. So when the state speed is 0, the equilibrium state is 0 in which both velocity and acceleration is 0. So dx by dt is equal to y and dy by dt is equal to minus f x x dot. So dividing both we get dy dx the slope of the curve as equal to minus f x x dot divided by y. So example determine the phase plane of a single degree freedom oscillator. So x double dot plus omega square x equal to 0 x dot equal to y y dot equal to minus omega square x. So we can write dy by dx equal to minus omega square x divided by y and separating the variable we get y dy 
plus omega square x dx equal to 0. So, integrating we get y square plus omega square x square equal to c, where c is a constant. Depending on the value of omega and c, we get a series of ellipse. So, the phase plot for this type of system is shown here. Each of these curve represents the ellipse. Okay. Now, let us solve some numeric uh, exercise given, give some exercise problem. So, here two equal masses are attached to a string having high tension as shown in figure. Determine the natural frequencies of the system. The system mass is attached to a string which is under high tension. So, therefore, displacement is small. If I do not consider the mass of the uh, string very high in compared to m1 and m2, then we can consider this as a lump mass system. So, we draw the free body diagram and uh, here we apply the D L Lambert's equation. So, if uh, displacement of the mass m1 is x1 and displacement of the mass m2 is x2, we introduce the inertia force as per the D L Lambert's principle here and showing in the free body diagram. Then we write the equilibrium equation for the mass m1 at any time instant is equal to minus m1 x1 double dot minus x1 by L into T minus x1 minus x2 by L into T. This is coming because of the component of the tension in the vertical direction considering theta is small. So, ultimately after rearranging we get m1 x1 double dot plus T by L x1 plus x1 minus x2 by L T. Again this is a 2 degree of freedom system. Similarly, for mass m2 we can write the equilibrium equation as m2 x2 double dot plus x2 t by l plus x2 minus x1 t by l equal to 0. So, to obtain the natural frequency first let us uh, here no damping is present. So, let us find out the matrix equation. This is the mass matrix m1 0 0 m2 and this is the acceleration vector x1 double dot x2 double dot and here the stiffness matrix you are seeing here. Uh, so, natural frequencies can be obtained by putting x1 equal to a1 sin omega t, a2 sin omega t. Here it is x1 double dot and x2 double dot. So, that means uh, if I differentiate this equation, then it will be minus omega square a1, again sin omega t will be coming and minus omega square a2 sin omega t will be coming. So, uh, ultimately you will get a equation in which the coefficient of a1, a2 are to be written in the determinant form. So, for this system let m1 equal to m2 and we write the coefficient of a1 and a2 in the determinant form and for non-trivial solution of this system we equate the determinant to be 0. So, after expanding the determinant and solving for omega, we get omega 1, the first natural frequency equal to root over t by ln, second natural frequency omega 2 equal to 1.73 root over t by ln and unit is radian per second, it is circular natural frequency. Second example, we take a disc which is uh, mass is m2, but it is rigid. Uh, disc is uh, supported at this point O and it is free to rotate and uh, at one end the spring K1 is attached and with this uh, spring a mass M1 is also attached. Similarly, at the other end you will find that the spring K2. So, these are one end is supported on the base, it is fixed, but this mass is allowed to move in this direction, vertical direction. So, now let us use the Newton second law. So, again we find that m1 x double dot, this is the acceleration equal to minus k1 for this mass, for this mass m2. First we will write for m1 and then we will go for m2. So, if we write for m1, m1 x double dot that is the transitory motion 
equal to minus k1 x minus r theta. x is the displacement and r theta is the initial stretching of the spring. So, relative displacement is x minus r theta. So, this is the spring force. Similarly, for mass m2, mass m2 this pulley has the moment of inertia j which is equal to half m2 r square and j is half m2 r square. So, we write j theta double dot equal to minus k2 r into r theta by taking moment about the O plus k1 x minus r theta into r. So, taking j is equal to half m2 r square we can write two equations now and in matrix form we write this m1 0 0 half m2 r square x double dot theta double dot acceleration variable and k1 minus k1 minus k1 r plus k1 plus k2 r square x theta are the displacement variable. Note here these are the acceleration variable and it is equal to 0. Okay. So, frequency equation is obtained as the polynomial. Uh, this is actually a quadratic in omega square. So, one can solve this equation and then find the omega 1 and omega 2 which are the natural frequency of this system. So, in summary, let us see what we have done. In this lecture, we introduce coordinate system and constraint equations. Holonomic and non-holonomic types of constraints are illustrated. Then we discussed about the derivation of equations of motion in dynamic system using Newton's second law or D'Alembert's equation. Phase plane diagram for state of the dynamic system was also discussed. Lastly, some problems to find the equation of motions and natural frequencies were discussed. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.